Now, let me talk to you about what the format is going to be tonight for this program. And let me start by saying that we're going to assume that everyone has read the book, finished the book. This is not the kind of book club you can cheat on, because we will be talking spoilers about what happens uh, during the story. I'm going to begin with a discussion with Charmaine, and then a couple of members of the audience will be joining us to give, share their questions live. You know how we asked you in advance if you'd like to be part of it? Well, three people did come forward. We're so thrilled to have them there tonight. And then we are going to take questions from the audience, from the Q&A as the evening goes on. And we're going to have you drop your questions into the Q&A below in the chat. We would love to know where you're from, because at many of these events, we've had people from across the country. So if you want to drop in where you're from right now, um, if you're a member of a book club, just tell us a little bit about you. If you drop that in the chat, it'd be absolutely terrific. Um, we are not going to be looking at the chat for questions. So if you have a question you want to ask later on, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A so we're not sitting there looking for this later on. Now, with that housekeeping behind us, I'd like to welcome Charmaine, who is joining us from Italy, where it is now two o'clock in the morning. So nice to have you here. I think before I had you in the middle of the day, so you can be a night owl tonight for us. We so appreciate it. It's really great to be back and see you, Carol. Good to be back here and be with you and Jordan and the rest of the crew. And it's, you know, and we have the book. We want to remind you that it just came out in paperback yesterday. So this is fabulous timing. So I've got a paperback or the hardcover. And so if you have friends who haven't read it, just know it's out in paperback now. So they want to make sure they run out and pick up a copy. So you've lived in many places. You've lived in many places. You were born in New York, lived in the Caribbean, London, and now Italy. Did this give you some idea of what life had been like for the characters in Black Cake who found their lives upended on so many occasions? You know, I've, um, I, as you mentioned, I've lived in the West Indies. I actually did not live in London, but I've traveled to London and been in London. I would say that um, what I drew most from my personal experience in terms of living in different places um, came from my childhood years. I did spend time on the island of Jamaica. I went to school there for a number of years. And I think that some of those sensory details that you see from a different period in time um, involving a different part of the island in a sort of invented town, um, and nonetheless come from some of my own memories of what that felt like to be in a certain kind of climate, certain kind of garden, certain kind of water, eat certain kinds of foods. Um, and I really use that to a great extent. I also lived in California, but for example, I don't surf <laughs> and I certainly don't do open water swimming in the sea. So a lot of that is invented, but I think we draw the ideas from the places in which we've lived. But, you know, imagination is that way, uh, Carol, it's, it's sort of a wide open field, mm -hmm. a fertile field, and you throw everything into it. So things that I've read or seen or heard or imagined mm -hmm. all go into that and come out in a, a work of fiction. Well, you watch those open water swimmers and you watch people surfing. And though you're not going to do this, there's an admiration for that. Or there's a like, where's the bravado that they are getting to do this? And I think that that definitely is something you walk away from saying, I couldn't get up on that board if my life depended on it. But I'm so glad that. sisters or a family of women. And here I felt like the brother and sister relationship was so important and it contributed to the dynamic of the story. Did they come to you as a brother and sister from the start? And I have to say, I always wanted a brother. I have a sister and I, but I've always coveted having a brother. So when I was reading this, it was, I was, you know, so into the brother story. They did come as a brother and sister. Now uh, the, the characters came to me in um, different moments. A couple of them came to me as short stories. And, and the part that really grew into the novel was the part from the past, the 1960s, the Caribbean, the two young open water swimmers, the fact that they were uh, girls on the cusp of womanhood, the fact that they were going against what was expected of them. And uh, in fact, this would lead to drama in their lives. Then I had a short story with the character who became Benny. 
But when Byron came to me, Byron is the brother in the present day and Benny is his younger sister. When he came to me, he sort of came to me with a sister and I realized that that was Benny. Mm -hmm. That part just sort of grew organically. And I don't really know where that comes from in the sense that it doesn't mirror, although I have brothers, it doesn't mirror an exact relationship that I know myself. But that idea of this conflict between people who were once inseparable, that idea of a brother and sister who really did love being together and have fun together, in addition to the conflict, um, did come up, you know, that, that sort of came up right away organically. Yeah, and, it, and the spirit between them, the dialogue between them, the camaraderie, exactly, is what, what you really see and you really feel from them. You know, one of the things I liked were your brisk chapters, which I think contributed, they were concise, but led to great storytelling. I could read a few paragraphs and know the answer to a question to move the story forward, but I found that I really loved the short pages. Did you go back and edit to be spare or did it start out that way? Did you start out, this is what it's going to be? I tend to write in very short bursts. Unlike my speech, I'm a chatterbox, but when I'm on the page, <laughs> I tend to go in, I tend to drop into a scene and jump out of the scene. And in fact, the influence, this sort of led me to write something called flash fiction, which is a kind of short story that's very, very short. And there are a number of writers in the US and the UK, for example, who are writing very, very short stories. And that also influenced the way in which I wrote these chapters because I'd, I'd gotten into the habit of sort of telling a story in a mm -hmm. short space. And I like that. Um, I think that you can leave an impression without giving all of the details. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many lines that I love in this book. Um, here's one that I'm going to just quote exactly because I just loved it so much. When you lived a life under any name, that life became entwined with others. You left a trail of potential consequences. You were never just you, and you owed it to the people you cared about to remember that because the people you loved were part of your identity too, perhaps the biggest part. And I rarely say that they're gorgeous sentences. I'm not one of those people that says, oh, the writing is so gorgeous. But there are many times that I was you know, pulling out sentences and I'm not being pretentious here. It's just because the writing just flowed so much and brought me into the moment. It's an honesty and rawness to it. And when you're writing, is that something that you're looking for? I think I write always from two... Um, points of motivation. Maybe I'm not saying that in quite the right way. Um, emotion mm -hmm. and um, rhythm. So I tend to think of, I don't say now I'm going to insert rhythm, but I tend to respond to my own thinking in terms of what is the emotion I'm trying to get at? What's the idea? And what is the feeling I want? Mm -hmm. Is it um, a feeling of being in the water? Is it a feeling of being angry. And so the language goes hand in hand with the emotion. But every once in a while, like that particular line came to me quite late in the process. I knew that I was writing about the different influences on our sense of identity and shifting concepts of family and home. And I knew that I was writing about a character in particular, Eleanor, the mother, mm -hmm. uh, who had hidden part of her identity mm -hmm. and the consequences that this had on her life and the consequences that it had on the lives of her children. Um, the, the thing that came to me, that particular line just came up as a realization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these characters came to me and I sort of followed them. And as I followed Eleanor, she came to that realization as she was communicating with her children. Mm -hmm. But I didn't say, I'm going to write the line in quite this way. It was the emotion that came mm -hmm. up and the understanding at the end of her life that, that, um, that sort of gelled for her. Was there a lot that you tossed out that you said, I'm not going to use this, I'm not? Or was this pretty much what we see? The story is basically what you see, but there were two, I guess you'd call them storylines. Uh, connected to actual characters and situations in the book that at a certain point I just thought, okay, it's got to go. Mm -hmm. And for those who have read the book, you know 
that I go into many different subjects. I follow a number of different characters. That is intentional. This book is meant to feel a bit like um, a series of conversations, uh, um, a walk through a number of neighborhoods or people's homes so that you enter and you exit. You pick up something as you go, but maybe you don't know everything when mm -hmm. you leave. Um, but there were a couple of storylines where, um, you know, you come to a realization that if you go in that direction, you're really going to have to keep going. And that's a whole other book <laughs> mm -hmm. or another five chapters. Um, so and there was one storyline that had to do with the ocean science Um I had this idea and it was in my original draft, but then I asked a friend of mine who is an ocean scientist and I said, is this really plausible? Do you think it would happen this way? And he said, well, no, not really because, and he sort of explained it. So I just dropped it, mm. you know, just dropped it. It's like, wait, I if I can't explain it, I'm not <laughs> going to have somebody else explaining it in their words. I'm not going to, you know, go there. Are you a good self-editor? Do you edit yourself very well? I'm not sure. <laughs> this okay. is my very first novel. Mm -hmm. What I can say is that my writing, my overall, my writing is very close to the way in which I began. Mm -hmm. um, but the structure uh, changed a bit because I really, this was out of, out of, this went back and forth in time, but I like to write completely out of chronological order. And so some of that was streamlined and I would say that I sort of amplified. There were scenes and situations where perhaps I sort of plumped up the idea of what was going on emotionally. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there was a question, for example, when the editor looked at it, they said, well, you know, we wonder. And then I'd answer that question in rewriting. But the, once the novel came together, I had that same basic vision. And then I just followed the characters. And just get you know, dropped into their lives. Today, I'm going to spend time with Benny. Today, I'm going to spend time. I love it. Uh, Debbie Moore is going to join us now. Debbie's been a part of many of our book group gatherings. She's from Syracuse, New York. And um, we always love hearing from her and hearing what her questions are going to be. So here is Debbie. Hi, Shermaine. It's Hello, nice Debbie. to meet you. I loved your book. I loved Thank the story. You. Um, and it, uh, something that came to me was, did you, why did you use Eleanor's black cake as the centerpiece or the main character of your story? And what role do you think food, particularly ethnic food, plays in a family's culture and experiences? Well, the cake just popped up in the story. Um, and the cake popped up as this, as the bequest, essentially, um, as you know, at the beginning of the book, mm -hmm. Eleanor leaves an unusual bequest. And part of that is a black cake. And it just sort of popped up as an idea. But when it did, I understood where it was coming from in terms of concepts of identity and stories and hidden information. My own mother made a legendary black cake. Uh, we didn't, we don't call it black cake in my family, but I know that she took such care to prepare it. And so a lot of those details were stolen from that. And I was surprised um, a couple of years before I wrote this book to find out that a younger member of my family who had never lived in Jamaica, who had not grown up in the way that I had, was very attached to that cake and wanted my mother's recipe. And when he texted me on my mobile to ask me for that recipe, I wrote down a few notes in my personal journal about the ways in which we form our identities, the stories that help us to shape those identities and transfer culture, and how food, and this gets to your second question, how food is actually a kind of language. So we can say, oh, food has ingredients. Food speaks to the agriculture. Food speaks to um, uh, culture and the way in which you prepare something. But I would say that in this particular book, it's more than that. It's part of the language. It's one of the languages that is used to carry stories from one period in time to the other and from one region of the world to the other. So that comes down to the idea of ethnicity. It's a mm -hmm. story. Ethnicity is transferred to us through stories 
Mm-hmm. Those stories could be religious rituals. They could be habits on a on a you know Sunday evening. They could be dances, but they are stories that are transferred to us about how we should live, who we're supposed to be. Does this make sense, Debbie? No, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, the other question I have is, it seems that Eleanor's lying or failing to tell her whole story um, affected the way she raised her children, how they reacted to her. And why did you have her wait until after her death to tell her children the whole truth? Well, she was very conflicted. Uh, First of all, uh, she hid her identity Mm -hmm. for logistical reasons to protect herself and ultimately her family. Um, And towards the end of her life, when perhaps she might not have worried anymore, she wasn't sure. Um, But the bottom line was that she felt that she could not tell her story until she had resolved the issue of her missing daughter. Um, And we're giving spoilers here, but um, that was part of the problem. She was not able to resolve that. Um, And at a certain point, she realized that she was at risk of dying. She was quite ill and it was time to tell her children what was going on. But the two children who were um, able to sit down with her were not talking to one another, were not seeing one another. So just having them sit down in the room with her was impossible. And so she made this voice recording. Great. Thank you so much. There were so many secrets that were revealed there. Yeah, Debbie, it's always a great question. Always come in with a great question for us. Thank you so much. You know, the recording was a clever way for them to learn because if it had been written, they could have read it very, very quickly. But because it was the recording, they then had to sit and listen together. They had to be you know, like sort of trapped in the room together, like don't go ahead without me or whatever. And I fed, feel like that measured telling of the story would did more for the book. It just enhanced what was going on because they had to like turn it off and then think about what they just heard and think about how they were going to react to listening more. I think that it was, was it always envisioned as this long recording of what was going to happen? It was always envisioned as a recording. It got longer as the story got longer. I had to conveniently adjust the number of hours. Um, but, but seriously, um, it, it was always a voice recording because the idea was that um, she had a lot to say mm-hmm. and she had a lot of stories to share. And this goes back to that idea, um, which I was sort of, you know, I touched on when talking with Debbie, the idea that if your identity is shaped by the stories that are told and also by the stories that are not told, then this woman, as she begins to reveal the stories that have not been told, which will now change her children's lives, it it really sort of made sense that she should just speak. She's Mm -hmm. telling stories Mm -hmm. and you can hear her voice. And that also carries emotional weight. Mm-hmm. You know, in our family, my mom passed away um, in August this, this summer. And one of the things that we knew is that there was family in Italy. And my grandfather is the only one who came to the United States. Everybody else stayed there. And my mother went to visit years ago and everybody lives in the same town. They all have places in Rome. And I was just there. And I said, mom, did you ask why he left? And she said, no. And I said, mom, that was like the big question. So when she passed, I made sure that we alerted the relatives in Italy, which we had beautiful notes from them. They all invited us there. And I said, boys, when we go (laughs) to my husband and my kids, we are going to ask them why my grandfather left because they all had successful businesses. Everybody has stayed. So we're dying. And so there's that question in the family. So when I was reading this book, I was thinking of that, of the question you don't know the answer to, and who is going to tell you the answer, and who is the trusted narrator on this? Is Eleanor the trusted narrator of telling her own story? How are these children going to feel about it? So it was just that like you know, measuring kind of a thing. That is fascinating. In my own family, you know, across three generations, um, very few of us have lived in the same place been raised in quite the same way, even look um, alike. And so I also came from a family in which I never did know my grandparents. Mm -hmm. 
and I was aware of um, the the stories that are not handed down. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also, I don't know if this ever happened to you. I think it's an age thing. So, you know, when I was a kid, I would hear the same story over and over again. And then when I was an adult, but really an adult adult, you know, um, past the adolescence, et cetera, I'd hear the same story and suddenly much more was revealed. (laughs) And when I say I think it's an age thing, meaning suddenly your elders see you a little differently and they feel more comfortable speaking about certain details or times have changed. So the time between me being you know, seven years old and me being 30 years old would have all would have had an impact also on on society and the things Mm -hmm. we felt comfortable speaking about. So I think that that also that's also something that influenced my thinking in writing this book, the idea that the stories change and why do they change? Well, Eleanor's story changed because she was hiding something very consciously. And then she kept concealing it because she wasn't sure how to go forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, recently at my mother-in-law's house, we <laughs> unearthed a trunk and it was when they came from Germany and has all the stickers and stamps all over it with all the dates. And my son has inherited this piece. And we also found their passports and learned that they'd um, come here. She, my, my mother-in-law was born here. They'd gone back to Germany and made the decision to leave in early 1939. So you think about what was happening. So they've got these passports with the stamps, the Hitler stamps on the swastikas on the the, 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 um, passports. So you're seeing this moment of history of how the family could have diverted and gone a different way. And as we're reading the book, we realize if this didn't happen, that wouldn't have happened. Where would they have gone? What would have happened to the two of them? What would happen to everybody? So we're going to have Elenute um, Nicola. I think I've got that right. Nicola, join us. She's from Iowa City, Iowa, and she's got some questions. And I think the members of her book group are on with tonight as well. Am I correct? Uh, I'm on here. There you are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I think the idea of uh, secrets uh, is something that uh, hits, a, hits a nerve with me as you're talking about it. I think societally or age-wise, people used to be able to keep secrets more easily and also the idea is that it's okay to keep secrets a little bit. Uh, maybe nobody will find out, but nowadays everybody's supposed to, you know, knows everything about everybody else. There's more communication. Uh, and in my family, there was a secret that was never told and striving my sister and to me to some extent kind of crazy. But I think, uh, Charlene, what you said about uh, the character or why she didn't say anything does fit, but it also leaves me or leaves one other people with the idea that, um, it's too bad because she never had the opportunity to have the, uh, an in-person discussion or communication or a, a connection with the people that she was talking to. But I will also say that um, just in terms of the effect dramatically, it's a, it's a wonderful a device to use a recording like that. It reminds me a little bit of mystery stories that are told all around the table after the the uh, someone dies and is going to uh, leave clues. So it, it, it works dramatically in addition to uh, making logical sense for her. Uh, but that's not even my question. <laughs> I might get to answer, but ask my question. Uh, you did speak a little to it. It has to do with the writing and how you got the plot going, because as I was reading it and they took notes to make sure I could figure out who was who, um, how did you put the plot together? Now, you said the characters uh, were important to you and you had read, been writing little short stories. Well, that I could understand. But it, then it brings up the basic point that I have, which is how did you put all this together? I also wondered, and I think you've answered part of it, you didn't put it together like a math grid. You know, this character is related to this one and that one, because you did say that um, one thing that was uh, for for all of them was that there was a conflict between some characters who uh, were believed to be inseparable, uh, but really weren't. But but still, they were all connected in some way. How did you um, <laughs> how did you make them all uh, make sense? How did you do the plot? <laughs> <laughs> well, the the characters came to me organically, yeah. and so did most of the plot. Meaning, I would just write 
I'd write scenes. And I actually had a number of scenes when I realized, ah, this is a novel. I'll just keep going. Um, I, the, there, there's the way in which my brain happens to work. And then there are some technical devices as well. So when I reached the point um, at which I felt, oh, this is a bigger story. And those two girls swimming out in the sea are actually connected to these two siblings um, in the present day. Um, what would happen is then other characters would step in, but they would step in. If you imagine that you step out of your house and you walk down to a street market, which is common in Rome and common maybe in New England or some smaller towns, let's say you step out and you run into Carol. Oh, hey, Carol, how are you doing? Uh, I'm going to a party. And then you run into Ellen Mute. And she says, yeah, you know, I'm going to the car wash, but then I'm going to go to a party. And then you discover that they happen to be going to the same party, but maybe they don't know each other. All right. So I give this sort of analogy. That's sort of what happens in my mind in terms of fiction. These characters are coming up and suddenly they're part of a community and you begin to see the whole story. But I pretty much had the basic story, meaning this woman has a secret um, her children are about to find out and the secret is connected to the people in the past. So there was already that idea and the rest grows. It's as if you're learning things as you go along. So I had ideas. I began to learn things as I went along. And then I used technical devices to get organized. Elenuta, you mentioned a math grid or was it you, Carol? Yeah, I did. Um, okay, yeah. So... Um, what I do is I do what some people call mind mapping. So let's say I take a piece of paper like this. Usually it's bigger. Um, I did not plot out certain things, but I ask questions after. So I said, why would Carol and Elenute be going to the same party? What is the connection? And if this one leaves at this time, can she get to the party before something else happens? That's, that's just an example. In other words, I looked at Byron and Benny, and I thought, well, if Byron is this age in a certain year, Benny's going to need to be that age. Do I need to adjust their ages? If, um, if I want uh, Eleanor to meet up with certain people in the UK, I need to be careful. I'm checking the years or the circumstances. Is it plausible for um, a certain thing to happen to one of the characters in that period of time mm -hmm. and in that particular country? Do I know enough about this fact, which I remember from my own life, to use that in a fictional scenario? Let me go do some research. So there are technical devices in which you have this information. I start mind mapping, I doodle to ask myself questions. And in my computer, I have files. I always write in files. So I might categorize at a certain point, I had a number of stories categorized under Byron. And I looked at those files and I said, okay, this needs to go here. Do I want to add this information to that chapter? So I had characters, I had the story sort of written and then I would break it down and ask myself whether I needed to move things around. Um, and I use files in my computer quite a bit. Um, and again, the fact that I write in short pieces makes it a little easier to move things around, but then you end up with 119 chapters, you know? Hmm. Well, did you um, possibly, <clears throat> Is it possible that all the characters didn't need to be in there? Uh, did you feel, well, this one could have met with this one, but maybe I didn't need to have that character in there at all because the ones you did put in there were also connected. It's just, I, it's hard to believe that you uh, had any sense of those connections to start with. And maybe you're saying you didn't, I don't know. Well, at the very beginning, before I knew I had a novel, I did not. Um, uh -huh. <clears throat> what happened is I do have a lot of characters and some people may think I sort of added them just to add, but absolutely no. I, no, they do I had fit. all of these voices. Yeah. That's right. And That's why I was so amazed how, how you could have them all fitting. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give an example. There's a, a minor character, but I consider that character to be important. His name is Short Shirt. It's a nickname yes. for this fellow who ends up working for Little Man. And he has his whole story. Um, 
And Short Shirt came to me as this person <clears throat> who was sort of nabbed. Excuse me, I'm really um, <clears throat> clear my throat again, or we'll just live with the frog in my throat. Mm -hmm. um, he was sort of nabbed for doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing, right? And that came about, that character came about as this person who was a possible suspect uh -huh. yeah. in the major murder. In a the little book. bit, yeah. The rest grew out of this idea. It just started tumbling out. This person who had lived a certain kind of story, who was very attached to his sister, which is kind of a parallel between Byron and Benny. The, I love these brother-sister attachments that are, are loving and also healthy as children. So she really took care of him when he was a child, and now he's trying to take care of her now that he's a young adult. Um, and, and, and the pain of that relationship also, the difficulties they experienced, all of that just came tumbling out. And so the connection was there from the start, but the things that his story tell us about indigenous lifestyle on the island, the, the knowledge of medicinal plants, the difficulties that a young woman might experience at the hands of someone who was being coercive, all of that grew out of his connection to the story. And I didn't really have to work at it. It just came out. So a person might say, well, this guy is a minor character. You could skip him. And I think, oh, but no, because I feel that he speaks to so many things that are just comments on the way in which people were living, mm -hmm. on the importance of nature, on the importance of loyalty in relationships, and on the um, motivating power of anger, of rage, of the desire for revenge. And, and it certainly didn't hurt that even for a little while, one could say, well, could he have done it? Because that's what we're trying to figure out anyway. Sure, it fits. Well, in this story, a lot of people could have done it. I mean, no, oh, yeah. it this way. in this story, a lot of people would have liked to have, <laughs> would have liked to have done it. No, it was really terrific. Thank you for sharing your question. So appreciated it. Thank you, Elenita. It's It was interesting conversation Thank you. there. You know, at the start of each chapter, there's a name or a word, and there's something that we know kind of what the chapter is going to be about. And often it's a new character being introduced to us, or so that chapter gives us pause. Were these chapter titles always there? Like, did you always say, mm, I got that, or did you go back and add those later? Some I added later. The ones I added later were more likely to be the ones that had the person's name, okay. where um, in organizing a book that had many different voices and different timelines, it was more useful to name the person to help the reader, because, okay, I'm writing it, but I'm a reader too, to help the reader return to that person or understand that they're coming back to a certain period or understand that they're meeting someone new. Um, the other chapters tended to draw their name from some idea that was there, you know, mm -hmm. some feeling. And often it began with the, the name, with the um, word, mm -hmm. the word or two that made up the chapter name. Often that was the very first thing that I wrote on the page before going into that idea. Yeah. And, you know, what I found when I was reading is, this is one of probably one of the most unique books that I've read. And I think that most of our readers would probably agree with me. And it was a very ambitious, but well done first novel. And the fact that this was the first novel that you put together, and it was just so special. I mean, so many people have read this book and called me afterwards and said, thanks for putting this one in my hands. I might not have picked this up. But, and I'm seeing people in the chat saying the same thing, is because people were saying, this is just so different. And in a book, in a book world right now, which so much is vanilla, it's vanilla, 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 it's the same book over and over. I think it was so delightful to have something that was so different, that made us think, that made us wonder where the story was going to go. And I'm betting that most in the audience would um, agree. And people are saying, like, my book club loved it. And I think it's because it challenged you as you were reading instead of just here goes the story, plot, plot, plot. 
It was, what is she going to do next? How is she going to get us? Somebody is just saying that um, she read it three times. And I think that that's really interesting to wow. see in reading it three times. Well, thank you. I, I didn't put my glasses on in time to see who read it three times, but thank you for taking the time to read it three times. Yeah, um, you could have been my editor. <laughs> It could be your editor, your agent. These are the people that are going on. Um, Debbie Chang uh, Klasinski is going to be joining us now. She's from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Deborah, thanks for joining us. Hi. Hi, Charmaine. Hello, Deborah. So I was really interested to read this book when I heard there was a Jamaica connection because I was born in Jamaica, um, left when I was 14, and my family moved to Canada. But before I ask my question, you mentioned that you called black cake something else. What did you call it? Well, everyone, I, I just call it rum pudding because my mother tended to make the pudding version, meaning fully steamed. I'm lazy. I make only the cake, um, which is a little faster. But um, my mother called it plum pudding, which is reminiscent of the British plum pudding. I call it rum pudding or rum cake. A lot of people in Jamaica, I don't know if people in your family do this, Deborah, call it just Jamaican rum cake, but it's not only Jamaican, it's made on a number of different islands, right? So I noticed that um, a number of people, for example, from Trinidad and other islands do call it black cake because of that dark color. Ah, see, okay, I left when I was 14. So I remember it as Christmas cake, because that was the time when it was served. And I actually didn't like it because it was too rummy. You know, as a child, I didn't like that. But um, anyway, my question was, so I am Jamaican Chinese. And I wondered if you have any Chinese heritage. Yes, you know, I, I tend not to talk about my um, family much, but I guess I should just explain that my mother um, was of Chinese heritage. She was the only person born and raised in Jamaica in my immediate family. Other people like me, they were born elsewhere and then lived in Jamaica for a while, including my, my father and his family. Um, and in fact, Although this story is not at all about her, and I don't think it really resembles um, her life in particular, the first time I understood that there was some kind of, for example, prejudice and that it continued, it, it had to do with her because she made a comment about, she lived in the US um, all of my life, but um, she made a comment about going back to the island um, and having people make comments when she went into a store in a small town um, and her, and they were not, they were not, uh, what do we say? They weren't kind comments, but they didn't realize that she could understand because they were speaking in Patwa. And so she answered them in Patwa and they sort of, oops, and then just sort of relaxed and then they went ahead. So it, it probably had more to do with the idea of not only her ethnicity, but also the idea of, her being perceived as a foreigner um, in a small town. Um, but yes, yeah, so she, she definitely had some influences in her ways and her habits in the United States that I can see go back to being, having grown up on that island, but also having had um, one half of her family, I should specify, um, that one half of her family came from China and so she also had some habits at the table and, and you know, cultural inheritances um, in, in, her, in her way of you know, managing the household, in her way of eating. But the cooking was 100% Jamaican. Okay. And is that why you chose to make Covey's father Chinese Jamaican? No. And here's the thing. I lived in Jamaica. So I lived around people of different um, ethnicities. And no, he just came up organically. And then it made sense because then he could be a shopkeeper. And as we know, in that particular time period, I actually never did know um, a shopkeeper of Chinese ethnicity in Jamaica. Maybe I wasn't in the right town, but I knew, were, pardon me? My grandfathers were Your both. grandfather. Exactly. Yeah. So you're talking about a generation where in the case of Lynn, Covey's father, that's exactly what he would have been doing at that time, because it was a time when, although um, 
we're talking about a very small percentage of the local population, it was a time when that particular kind of business, you know, the dry goods store, the supermarkets, had many people, um, not many people, were predominantly operated by people of Chinese descent or Chinese birth. And so um, it just all kind of came up naturally. It came up naturally. But what I said to Carol before um, makes sense, meaning everything in our imagination is seeded by what we live in real life. And so I took something that I learned from history and put it into the story. But in my own childhood, I was living around a person who might have had something in common with that character. I knew other people, you know, my best childhood friend, my father's friends, but they had different lives. They had modern lives, meaning at a, but, but they also told stories. And so it's interesting how things seep into your head. And then you have a fictional story that tells a bit of the truth. Mm-hmm. Right. He was also depicted in a negative way, though. I wondered why you did that. It's interesting because Cubby's father got her into trouble. And that was the thing. And he had a specific problem. But the interesting thing is people always say, oh, Lynn, you know, he was terrible. And I always think, Lynn, I would like someone to tell me what kind of choice they would have made. You know, he was living a very diff- he was living a very difficult situation. I also thought that Lynn was very generous. He was very generous. He would sell to people from his store, people he knew would never um, pay him back. And one of the things he said to his partner, um, Covey's mother, once was, "What am I? Am I supposed to let them go without?" You know, that was just a natural. Am I supposed to let them go without? So he would sell things to people. Mm -hmm. knowing that they would never pay him back. He always made sure that his late brother's, um, you know, children had, um, you know, when he had extra money, he would give them money. He would take his daughter and her friends over to the falls to play. Um, So it's interesting. He makes a decision that precipitates disaster on his family. He makes it from a point of view I think he makes it from a position in which he doesn't see another way out. He's gotten himself into trouble, but not because he sat there saying, I'm going to get myself into trouble. He has a specific problem. He has an addiction that causes difficulty. And then he gets mixed up with the wrong person. And he understands that it's not acceptable, but he's not sure what else to do. So I think that Lynn is an example of the kind of character that I do love in fiction. We are challenged to dare to look at difficult situations and dare to say, um, uh, not dare, we are challenged to say what we would do differently. How do I know? I know what I would do differently. I don't know how I would have acted differently had I been Lynn. And even though he creates the greatest drama, not the greatest, but one of the greater dramas in this story and changes his daughter's life for the worse, um, I don't see him as a villain. I don't see him as a negative person. I actually see him as a person with a soft heart. And later you see that sort of strange situation in which he's managed to find some sort of redemption in the sense that he continues to be a person who essentially is a generous person. It's just that previously he wasn't able to manage his life. So it's interesting that you say that because I don't want people to feel that, you know, especially for those of us who um, come from certain demographic groups, we're very sensitive about feeling that people should be depicted positively or negatively. And in fact, one of the things I say, though, is that we should be able to do both. But yeah, I, I refuse to see Lynn as a villain, despite everything. And some people will say, that's not right. You're, you're making excuses. No, I'm not. I think he's a very complex character. And in fact, he's one of those characters I'm thinking about. Uh, I continue to think about and wonder if I should be writing something else about him. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. Okay. I know. I just have one quick question. The last one was, why did you never name the island when it was so clearly Jamaica? Well, originally, it, it, um, the historical, uh, just to give a bit of background, and you know this, Deborah, um, every historical event that is mentioned in the book is absolutely true to that specific island. However, as I wrote, the original feeling was the kind of place, the kind of place, the kind of water, the kind of setting. Then I was I knew it was it was based on the north coast of Jamaica, but because I played with locations and collapsed them, so we know that people surf in that area. We know that there were certain bays and certain um, positions in that part of the island. I collapsed them. I think part of me felt that because it was fictionalized, I felt uncomfortable naming it. Then, as I went forward, I thought, no, I'll have fun. This is. This is so clearly that island because I named the historic events. But towards the end, I realized that in the case of Byron and Benny, the brother and sister who have never been to that island and who at the end of the story still do not know everything that you and I as readers know, for those two, the island remains behind a kind of veil. You know, there isn't full knowledge. And so I like that idea of leaving it as the island, because that is really the heart of everything that happens, the heart of everything that radi radiates outward after that. And I should just add, Deborah, if I'm not going on, uh, on the subject for too long, that I do have this tendency, though. I like to write stories in which often I don't name the person and I don't name the place. So that started that way. Then I had some rationale and then I thought, no, I named the island once and I took it out. And I mm -hmm. thought, no, that Byron and Benny are still here and the island is still there. Um, let the historical details identify it. Okay, thank you, Charmaine. I wish I could talk to you all evening, but thanks. That would be lovely. <laughs> thank you, Deborah. <laughs> You know, when we last spoke, Black Cake was in development as a Hulu original series, and I've been following the casting updates, and I think they've started shooting in Bristol, if I'm correct. Have you seen anything? Have you heard any more about what's going on? Have you been on set? I've been on set um, under very uh, strict COVID um, uh, restrictions. Um, and it's, it was a wonderful experience. I can't say anything about the production, except that, yes, they, they have been shooting in a few different locations, and they're making progress, and I'm leaving it to those experts to do what they need to do. Um, but I will say it's, um, it, it was really lovely to meet some of the people who are involved in the production, uh, crew members who have worked together on other uh, productions, award-winning productions um, in other countries, and um, of course, meet the head writer, who's Marissa mm -hmm. Jo Sarar. Um, and I'll leave the rest to Hulu and Disney and, and the people who are really, mm -hmm. and the Oprah, Oprah's production company, the people who are really putting together this production. But um, I know that they've, they've shot the material for a number of episodes, and they're making yes. progress. This is great. Um, did you get a chair with your name on it when you came on set? Did they have a chair with no, your name? No, I, I did have a trailer with my little name in it. Okay. That's good. <laughs> Take a trailer name with you. you know. <laughs> I, I, Kristen Hanna was on set and she says, I'd want the chair. And I said, you must bring the chair home. The chair uh, has to go with you, yes, you know? Yes, yes. If you go on set again, you say, will there be a chair for me, please, with my name on it? <laughs> and I will not be arriving, you know? So... This book has so much to talk about, and I'm going to move on to audience Q&A with our voice of God, our editorial director, Tom Donadio, fielding the questions. So if you do have questions, please drop them in the Q&A in the chat. You're talking to each other, but we don't want to have to go there and look for um, different questions. I am going to pick up what Patty's question is right now. Can we talk about the book cover? I'm going to pull it because luckily it was the same. So, and I, I have to admit that I remember when I first was looking at this, I didn't see a woman right away. I didn't see the person right away. So here we've got the same cover for both books. Um, so talk about this. What For both books, meaning the paperback? The, yeah, both, uh, you know, the, the hardcover and the paperback have the same cover. So yes. just talk to us about the imagery and is this the first one you saw? 
trying to do something without glare. There, um, oh gosh, I think I've now forgotten what else there might have been. But early on, there was a conversation about the importance of water in this story because, um, you know, the novel uh, bears the name of a food, mm-hmm. black cake, but, um, and food is important. We've talked about that before, but water is important too. It's a metaphor. It's, um, it's very important in the lives of the two girls who live in the 1960s in the Caribbean. And then it becomes important in the lives of some of the characters in the present day. Byron, for example, is quite the surfer. You know, and so, um, and and also there's a crossing of oceans, you know. So this particular cover I love because many people say what you said, Carol, that they didn't see the face at first. Mm -hmm. I saw the face and I love that. Right. But I think it's interesting how we perceive there are people who see it and people who don't. And, you know, you see the water, you see the image of a face that to me makes me think of a female and that would make sense, but it's not really that specific. And um, the cover design, um, uh, I should mention Jaya Maselli, who was responsible for the cover design along with other colleagues at Penguin Random House. Really beautiful, the colors and everything. I even like the way the, the font, the font and the way it just looks like it's painted on there. Every single detail of the cover is just exquisite. And I think it makes the book even more special. You know, when you sit there and you, the packaging really works on a book and even on the back, the paperback, the call out line, you can't choose what we inherit. We can choose we want who we uh, become. And I just love that. So, the, you know, pull lines that end up coming through. And then the quotes from, you know, all the media, uh, of all the fabulous quotes you got. A delicious debut, ravishing, <laughs> multi-generational story that's meant to be savored. I mean, these are fabulous quotes for, especially for a debut novel. Which you do you feel much more accomplished, my dear, much more accomplished. <laughs> so, Tom, what have we got for questions down here? All right. Yes, we have some really good questions here. Um, Deborah asks, what inspired you to write Black Cake? Are there parts of the book that reflects your life? It's interesting. Um, so... Uh, another Deborah, we were just speaking with another Deborah from Michigan um, who, you know, we were talking about some of the details that the concrete details that are stolen from things that I have lived or seen or heard. But in fact, the story at its heart is not at all autobiographical. This is not my family. This is not my life. But if there is something that is truly personal, while I may take concrete details from the places in which I've lived and the people, you know, maybe things people have said or things I've read, um, the, the really personal thing, I think, is the idea that, you know, I come from a multicultural family. I've moved around quite a bit. And, and to be very specific, most people come from multicultural families. But what I mean is that just across two or three generations, you know, we've grown up in different places in different ways. Um, we don't quite look alike. Um, you know, we would be described differently physically. And um, I'm very much aware of the way in which we often navigate. We have a sense of who we are inside. We have a sense of self. We may describe ourselves in a certain way to identify ourselves. And then there's the rest of the world. And we have to navigate the world constantly in terms of what people expect of us, the stereotypes people have, the pressures people put on us. Um, That's true of everyone. But in this particular book, I would say that there are a couple of characters that I call in-betweeners. That's my informal name for them. And Benny is one of them. Uh, A person who was seen one way, but could be seen another. And if she chooses to identify in one way, then uh, some people criticize her and vice versa. And um, then you have the young women who are just, um, they're admired for being extremely strong, young women in the Caribbean, um, exceptional swimmers uh, with potentially a great future. Um, People enjoy that, but that's supposed to be contained. And what they have is such a strong sense of self um, that is amplified by the fact that they are physically very strong. 
and obviously very brave because they're out there in the sea and they're very young. Um, and, and that actually causes a great deal of trouble for one of the characters, Covey. So that I would say, Tom, is the core answer to that question, that the idea that our identities are shaped by other people's stories, our sense of self, relationships, as, as mentioned by Carol in that quote, and that we're constantly navigating mm -hmm. uh, the world based on our identities. And at the heart of it, all of that is shaped by the story. What are the stories that are told to us? What are the stories that we tell to ourselves? What stories do we tell to others about who we are? Mm -hmm. And then what stories do they try to impose on us? Mm -hmm. uh, and that core, that emotional core is something that I think I've lived, I think many people live that for different reasons. And you may hear a story at one stage of your life and think of it one way and think of it completely differently later on. And all of a sudden I'll be like, wait, that's really the truth of what they were talking about there. And I just didn't understand it. You know, I, I have a fun story that I'll mention, um, which is a factual thing. And, and Deborah would have known this Deborah from Michigan who grew up in Jamaica and uh, then moved to Canada. And that is when I moved to Jamaica as a little girl, you know, I was young enough that there are certain things that made such huge impressions on me that they remain with me. And one of those was being told that there was this huge earthquake in the 1600s and um, the city slipped into the sea. The city is Port Royal, once the richest uh, city in the so-called new world. And um, there was always that story, the city slipped into the sea because of the earthquake. So it was only in researching this book when I wanted to be sure that I double checked the date, et cetera, that I thought, well, why do people say the city slipped into the sea? Apparently there was some slippage, but can you guess what it was, Carol, that never occurred to me? I who have lived in LA, I who have been to Indonesia after a huge earthquake, right. uh, I who live in Italy where we have seismic activity, it was a tsunami. <laughs> So when, so when they say it slipped under the sea, there was some slippage, but there was also a, a, a sea surge yes. at one point. There were a series of earthquakes. And that's an example of a story that you hear one way. And when you're a child, it, the city slipped into the sea. Yeah. And, and you, you know, live with that. Making me thinking about Phuket, Thailand. Remember the big tsunami there? My business partner's daughter was there. And she was in a, one of those swim up bars having a last drink before they leave. Oh and her goodness. boyfriend is looking towards the water and he sees the water going out and he grabs her and he says, run. So literally they ran in their bathing suits, no passport, nothing. I mean, she's in like a bikini with a Rolex watch, as her father says, and they're just running. And the beach was completely like the whole thing was completely annihilated. And no passport, showing up, trying to get home, people giving them clothes. And so when you think about things like that, and you've now heard of somebody doing it, yes, it did slip into the sea. Everything was gone. That's what happens. But the interesting thing is, despite my contemporary knowledge, it didn't occur to me. Mm -hmm. I, had, I kept looking it up. In fact, I kept looking up the phrase, what really happened? You know? Yeah, yeah. And you don't really think about it until, wait a second, what was that? And how did that happen? Tom, is there another good question? Those are good ones. Uh, yes, Rose asks, uh, this book covers so many issues, adoption, abuse, environmental protection, sexual orientation, racial profiling, and rape, to name a few. Was it a conscious decision to touch on these issues? Excuse me, I nearly laughed, Tom, when you said to name a few. There are <laughs> many issues, aren't there? Right. Um, was it a conscious issue? No, some of the things just came up naturally. These are the things that happened to the characters. Um, but without it, uh, yeah, I would say they came up organically. But I pressed on some of them because if you're dealing with anyone who swims in the sea, you're going to want to talk about pollution and climate. Um, if you're dealing with anyone who's a woman, sorry, you're going to deal with certain issues because it's mm -hmm. so common. It's not that these experiences are exclusive to women. 
And one has to be very careful to say that, for example, issues of certain kinds of abuse, it's that we know that it's very common to women. And so it just came up naturally. It's not that I sat there saying, I am going to highlight this issue. These were the dramas that were happening to the characters. What I did do was then go and do some research and say, okay, so I have a certain thing happening, or for example, the bullying, Benny's bullying. I said, let me double check because I'm pretty sure I read a study that said that this is quite common for a certain demographic and even more common for women. Let me double check. That's not in the book, but I read it and um, made note of it to reassure myself that, that you know, it was right there. It was um, plausible even though you have characters who are really experiencing things that at times seem to be at the limit of plausibility, the fact is that these things happen to people are plausible. Mm. Did that answer your question, Tom? It very much did. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Juanita asks, how long did it take you to write the book and how many different endings were there? Okay. So um, I really, uh, because I started writing stories and, and it took me a while to realize I was writing a novel, I would say that between late, late 2017 and late 2018, I pretty much had a novel. By 2019, I was beginning to show it to people, but then with feedback, I was, you know, writing buddies and so forth. I was starting to rewrite. And then I met my amazing agent and editors, and they helped me to further amplify or polish but the story is basically that story. Um, I mentioned to Carol earlier in this conversation that I actually removed a couple of storylines. One of them I might, I, I, I don't remember if I removed them before the editors at Penguin Random House um, saw that. And then I amplified some things because people would say, oh, this is wonderful. Um, could you help us to understand certain things a bit more? Mm -hmm. Or what is the thinking behind that? So that's the editing process. Um, and, you know, Tom, you sort of asked a two-part question and I forgot the second part. So the thing was, how long did it take? And was the ending, how many endings? Is that, was that the question? Uh, yeah, how many different endings were there? Okay, so I will give a hint to people. This is for people who have read the book so they know. The chapter in which we understand who has committed the murder always was the end of the book. Always, 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 until the end. Later on, um, this idea of uh, some other things that um, family members have to do um, towards the end of the story and them coming together, those ideas were actually earlier because I love to write out of chronological order. Um, and I wrote in the original book, I wrote everything. And then I had that scene right there at the end. It's still essentially at the end. It's the last really concrete thing that happens in this book, right? That, that is, is a question, an important question. And I kind of liked it that way, you know, mm -hmm. um, that idea. It's almost a smile. One shouldn't say one smiles when talking about a murder, but it has to do with the characters involved, and how that happened, um, everything else has to come first, and then you know what happened. So there were only ever two endings, um, which is that chapter and the chapter, the, what comes afterwards in the actual book now, which, right. which is essentially the scene where family members and friends are together. Mm -hmm. um, and just in case someone snuck in who hasn't read the book, I won't say much more, but... Um, oh, they let have me see. got to read. They have got to have read the book. <laughs> oh, they have to, to be allowed. So yeah. I'm looking Spoilers now and I'm, I'm double checking because I forget my own book. So yes, it's only one chapter because I think it might have been... Here's an example. I had stuff from this very, very last chapter divided into two other chapters. So then they were consolidated and put after the second to last chapter, which was my original ending. Interesting. Interesting. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, what can you tell me about the audio book? I read it a year ago, so I plan to listen this time. Um, the audio book uh, is done. Um, by the way, I think it has been listed as one of 
Audible's, you know, the the audiobook service connected mm-hmm. to Amazon, mm-hmm. one of Audible's best um, audiobooks. And wow. I say that because, you know, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with two amazing actresses um, who specialize in voice uh, narration as well, Lynette Freeman and Simone McIntyre. You can remember their names and look them up on Instagram. Lynette Freeman, Lynette R. Freeman and Simone McIntyre together did all of the voices in this book. And um, I thought they were amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, if you like audiobooks, it's worth a try. I must admit that because I have a lot of these very short chapters and sort of cryptic chapter headings, I wasn't sure how it would work as an audiobook. Um, and, and I do love the white space, you know, that you mm-hmm. get when you have a shorter chapter. But um, the, the narration and the acting in that audio book was beautiful, I think. And thank you again to Lynette Freeman and Simone McIntyre. Mm. Somebody just wrote that they listened to the audio book and just loved it. Somebody just oh. wrote in the chat. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Um, Margaret asks... Did you ever think about including a recipe for black cake in your book? Yes, only because people kept asking me to put it in. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but no, no, I um I never intended to put a recipe in the book. Um I I did intend to refer to the recipe and as you know there's a chapter where Benny looks up the recipe. And that's part of why I didn't include it. It does exist. We do have um, a transcribed version of Eleanor's black cake recipe. And it's it's in the book. (laughs) And now it's in the paperback. Exactly. And I, and I, I'm aware of that and that that was approved, but in the original book, I didn't want it. Paperback's fun and it's different and it has some other um, support materials. So this is Eleanor's black cake recipe. Um, But as you know, in the book, when Benny finds her recipe, those quantities aren't there. The details aren't mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. So we had to extrapolate. I just want to remind everybody of something with this black cake, because we were looking at this to make with our book group. And somebody, we have one woman who bakes beautifully for many of our meetings. She says, I'm going to bake. The last ingredient is five to six cups of dried fruit, raisins, prunes, or currants, soaked at least four months in white or dark rum or port to cover. If using dates and maraschino cherries, they should be only added at mixing time. Now, the four months was the part that threw us off. So if you're going to be doing this with your book club in a few months, start soaking now. So we were just laughing because when we saw that, I was like, wait a second, four months. And it's sort of like when I read a recipe and it says chill for three hours. And I'm like, (laughs) I have no panic. Yeah, read the whole recipe. Well, my, you know, if you think of Eleanor, she always had the jar of fruits. My mother always always had a jar of fruits. I actually have two in the house in part because I really don't bake black cake too often, mm-hmm. maybe once a year. Um, and, um, and I do believe in having them really soaked for a very long time, which is risky because in theory, if you soak it for too long, it could become bitter, but I've never had that experience. Um, I know people who soak for, who do a an abbreviated version. It is mm-hmm. possible. If you look up the right recipe, there are people who cobble together um, the fruit mixture and it works well. Mm-hmm. I just always laugh when it was the four months. Was yeah. like, hey, it's months. really more like a, it's really more than four months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll postpone the meeting, everybody. <laughs> well, now, while we're While we're on the subject, um, this isn't a question, but Jamie says, just to share, I made a black cake for book club when we discussed it. I totally understand why Eleanor didn't want anyone in the kitchen when she was making the cake. It took five hours and the kitchen was a mess, but everyone loved the cake and it made much more than predicted. So I froze the extra, more fun to come. (laughs) <laughs> That's wonderful. I'm glad you had such a great experience, Janie. Is it Janie or Jamie? I'm not sure. Sorry, um, Janie. Janie. <laughs> and Denise asks, what are you working on now? Do you imagine revisiting any of these characters? I keep thinking about certain characters, especially some of the more complex ones uh, who may appear to be one way, but may have much more going on in their backgrounds. Um, 
But currently, I am not writing what you would call a sequel or a prequel. I'm working on another multi generational story. I think that readers of Black Cake might enjoy it, but it is different from Black Cake. It does involve going back and forth in time, it does delve into questions of identity and relationships and um, the ways in which we transfer culture and heritage, but in a very different way from Black Cake. There are your hints, everybody. There are your hints. We have a date that this might possibly be coming out, or are we still percolating? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I, I'll leave that to the publisher. We're, oh, okay. We'll say when it's really ready, but you know, we're, we're getting there. You're getting there. Okay, that's mm-hmm. good. That's good. Because I think everybody here is just salivating for something new from you. I do feel that way. <laughs> Thank you. Tom, anything else? And I think that's pretty much it. A lot of what is asked, we basically already covered. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think that uh, pretty much covers it. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate your little voice of God or voice of God mm-hmm. bring up our stories. <laughs> and it's nice because you're really sifting through a lot of questions to make sure everybody was taken care of. We like to make sure that everybody who joined tonight really got their, their questions answered. You know, Eleanor talks about her life being one long swim, breathe deep and wide, take it one strip stroke at a time. And I feel like I need that framed up on my wall. Just take it one stroke at a time. Does this reflect how you view life? Take it at one stroke at a time. Not in every way. You know, I can be as, um, I, I can be like everyone else. Sometimes I'm not sure how to pace myself or how to approach life or how to deal with challenges. But um, it does reflect something I learned from marathon running. So I'm not an open sea swimmer. I'm not a surfer. But in the past, I ran marathons. You know, from my teen years, you, I, I would say that I ran for a good 20 years or so. And it continues to be part of my mentality. So the way in which that works is I do know that something that I do today is a building block for what will come later. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I can get as scattered as the next person and worried and inefficient. But I do know and I do believe that, for example, with writing, you have a thought, write a word. It doesn't have to be a page. You see something interesting, record it. Mm -hmm. And that will feed into future things. So I I think that's true of writing. I think it's sometimes true of any challenge that we face. Something is better than nothing is kind of my personal (laughs) mantra. Um, And uh, But I wouldn't say that it it characterizes my overall approach on a day-to-day basis. (laughs) But it sounds like good for the wall, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's good for the wall. I like my refrigerator. It's good for the refrigerator. Good for the refrigerator. Good for the refrigerator. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am going to send you the chat because there have been so many people that are just praising this book so much. And I want to make sure we will share that with you. We get the typed version of the chat and we'll send it on to you. Um, It was special when I spoke to you in February and the chance to revisit with you now was just a really, really incredible experience to share with all our readers as well. So thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. And thanks to the people who asked questions and who read. It's it's just been lovely as a conversation. It's great to see you, Carol. So great. I hope you can get to New York and I promise I'll come into the city the day that you do. And we'll find Kim and we'll go have a drink. How's that? We'll make that, that our, like our pledge. Plan. We're that sounds do. great. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so very, very much. And I will let you now go to bed. You can now, like, it's probably like 3.15 in the morning now for you. You can either go write. I can start writing. (laughs) I can start writing. It's a very early morning for you, for you very much so. And now we have information about two upcoming events. We've got two things happening. One is happening next week. um, And one is happening in January. So first, on Tuesday night next week, we are going to have an evening with 13 of our book reporter reviewers, and they are going to be sharing their favorite books of 2022. And sign up for this event is available on Book Reporter. So it's just Tuesday, December 6th at eight o'clock in the evening. Sign up is available. They are absolutely fabulous. I've seen a lot of what their picks are going to be. And when they did this event last year, it was one that was really beloved by everybody because it was great to hear them talking about their books. Amongst these 13 people, they've probably reviewed more than a thousand books on Book Reporter. So you know that you know they've got something to draw from. And next, we've got our next Bookachino Live Book Group event. 
is going to take place on Wednesday, January 25th. And our author guest will be Nita Prose. She will be joining us and she will be discussing The Maid, which is a New York Times bestseller, Good Morning America book club pick, and a book reporter bets on selection. So that will be available for you to sign up as of tomorrow. We have 150 book reporter talks to author interviews on our YouTube channel, including an earlier one that I did with Charmaine. If you'd like to take a listen to that one where we delved into other things besides what we discussed this evening. And if you want to stay on top of what we're doing, sign up for our newsletter where you can find out about all these events that we're doing. Um, the newsletter is available at tbrnetwork.com. There's a sign for newsletters and you can sign up whichever ones you want. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We could not do these events without knowing that we have a great audience that's going to show up. When I tell a publisher that we want to do an event, I just say, look, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I know we're going to draw a crowd. And we did that this evening. And I can't wait to see where all of you are from. So thank you for joining us. Good night. And we look forward to seeing you either Tuesday night or in January. So wish you happy holidays if you're not joining us on Tuesday. Thanks so much, everyone.